Hello, and welcome to Africa, this enormous and astonishing continent. South Africa, to be more precise, just a short drive outside Johannesburg. And I'm here to talk to a remarkable man, Credo Mutwa. When I first came to South Africa about 18 months ago, within two or three days, I was introduced to Credo Mutwa. I'd never heard of him at the time, but from the moment I met him, I didn't stop listening and he didn't stop talking for at least five hours. And within the first few minutes, I realized I wasn't just in the presence here of a man of great knowledge, and he's certainly that. I was in the presence of a genius, a unique human being. And Kreda Mutwa is without doubt the most incredible man it has been my honor to meet. Kreda is what some people around the world call a shaman, and some deeply, deeply ignorant people call a witch doctor. And to give him his official title, he's a Sanusi in the Zulu nation. Uh, Sanusi is the carrier, the keeper of the ancient knowledge, the ancient knowledge of so much, including the ancient knowledge of history of Africa, where all this came from, where the people came from, what the truth of history is, instead of the uh, largely nonsensical version of history that we get through the universities and the schools from very, very well educated professors who know. There are only two Sanusis left in South Africa. Credo is one. And that's terrifying because it means the true version of the history of this continent is dying being lost to this official nonsense that we're told is history, but it's absolute garbage. History has been rewritten. And the people who can put that history together again are going out of this world as they age and are not replaced. So you're about to have, as I have, the enormous privilege of hearing this man talk and seeing his knowledge preserved for as long as the electronic medium exists. He is the official storyteller and keeper of the history, the knowledge of the Zulu people. But you know, knowledge is a very dangerous thing when you're trying to hold people down into a mind prison, you're trying to manipulate them, you're trying to control them. And so people like Credo Mutwa who have the knowledge to rewrite history and therefore rewrite the present, they are very dangerous people to those that wish to control and suppress. This man has had endless threats to his life, endless attempts on his life, right up to the last few days. And he has upset the uh, hierarchy of his own people as much as he's upset those others in other cultures and other races that wish also to suppress the truth for reasons of preserving their own religious domination or keeping people in ignorance. And so I've come here to talk to Credo at length about many things. And this is a series of unique videos with a unique man. And what we're going to start out with is to concentrate on a bizarre story, <laughs> an off-the-wall story, you would think, but one which he is confirming at every turn from his own background, his own unique knowledge of this continent. Over the last few years, as I've been trying to uncover how the world's controlled by a few people, which it is, and who those people are, it has emerged from my research that Bizarre as it may seem, uh, a reptilian race from another world, interbred with humanity in the far ancient world, creating hybrid crossbreed bloodlines. You see references to these in the Old Testament and into the endless of the ancient texts in the Old Testament. It talks about the sons of God, which in the original is sons of the gods, plural, interbreeding with the daughters of men to create the hybrid uh, race, the Nephilim. These gods were the literal gods of the ancient people. And they used to sacrifice people literally to the gods. 
And these crossbreed bloodlines, as ancient accounts tell around the world, were put into the positions of ruling royal power in the ancient world. And then, as is happening today, when you do the genealogy of the ruling families and the ruling uh, positions of power in the world, be they the 42 presidents of the United States up to Bill Clinton, be they the British royal family, be the uh, aristocracy of Europe, any of these key ruling elites, the top of the banking system, the top of the global business system, you hit the family lines which go back to these same ruling lines of the ancient world, royal lines, that the ancient accounts say were the crossbreeds between humanity and these reptilian gods. In other words, a reptilian extraterrestrial race has been controlling planet Earth for thousands of years to this day and putting its genetic compatible bloodlines into the positions of power as presidents, prime ministers, banking leaders, business leaders, etc. And this explains so many things. Where we get the divine right of kings from, the divine right to rule because of the bloodline, the genetics. Why these ruling families of the aristocracy and the royal families have always incessantly interbred with each other, just as the Eastern Establishment families of the United States do that produce so many presidents and banking leaders and administrators of government in the United States. And, astonishingly, as bizarre as I keep saying, and <laughs> seemingly ridiculous as this story may be from our conditioned perspective of life and reality, when I started talking to Credo Mutwa from his African experience and knowledge of the most staggering depths and variety, he tells exactly the same story that I have uncovered around the world, exactly in great detail. And if Africa and the world is ever going to be free, and we are, then they have to listen to this man. And they have to listen. Now, I started out by talking to Credo about the origin of the knowledge that he is about to share with us for the first time in so many cases. Because this is the knowledge that only initiates normally get. But as Credo says, the world needs to know this. And so, this is a unique video. And this is a unique man. And like I say, I asked him first about the origin of the knowledge that he's about to pass on. When the white man started destroying our religion, when he started demonizing our gods, when he started ridiculing what we believed in and actually using educated Africans to destroy that ancient African religion. In many parts of Africa, say, our ancient religion went underground. And there were, call them secret societies, all over South Africa and Central Africa and East Africa and West Africa, where this knowledge was was stopped and kept by aging guardians, many, many of whom did not know that in other parts of the land there were other guardians who were doing exactly as they were doing. Now, when I first became a Sangom, I was already say, a person of education. I had entered school as a child of 14 years. And when I became a Sangom, I was a youth of 16 years. And what, what my aunt and my grandma, my grandfather, as well as my maternal grandmother, taught me 
shook me to the core of my soul. I found that the mission schools had been teaching me lies about my people all along. Missionaries had told us as children that the only light came to Africa with white people, that before the white men came, we black people had no idea about God. We had no belief in a life after death. And that our people were just a race of savages who used to lie around in the sun, womanize, fight, and drink beer every day. I was suddenly awakened to the fact that Africa, Africans had in fact been far greater intellectually than the missionaries were, were willing to give them credit for. That like the white men, we had astrology, astronomy, we had surgery. In fact, I found that Zulu surgeons in the early years of the 19th century and the 18th century and even beyond could perform operations which white surgeons were not capable of operating. And the more I learned about my people, the more I wanted to learn. And when my, my initiation under my aunt Mina and my grandfather Zigo had ended, I wanted to know more and more and more. And sometimes I had to pay a ghastly price in order to to gain this knowledge. My own research uh, around the world has certainly focused in on the fact that there is a force not of this world, shall we say, that is the common theme. What is your experience and your knowledge of an extraterrestrial involvement in the history of Africa? One of the most secret stories that was revealed to me is about these beings. This story was revealed to me first in Barotsident, then in the country today called Rwanda, once known as Rwanda Urundi. Then I learned about this story at that time on the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro. This is the story, a story you find throughout Africa. There was once a time when the blue sky was invisible, when the whole world was covered with mist, when you could not see the sun as it is now, you only saw it as a, a, a splash of white light moving slowly across the sky. At that time, there was an eternal drizzle every day of the year. At that time, People could not see the stars. People only saw the trees growing, trees which were very, very big. There was no desert at that time, only jungle everywhere where you went. At that time, say, people were what we call in Zulu, Nugubidi. A human being was both male and female in one body. And out of the sky, one day, came terrible objects. 
they were like gigantic bones made of huge gleaming gold. They were shaped like bones without strings, and they were bigger than the biggest mountains. They came out of the sky, bringing great noise, black smoke, and fire with them. And out of those huge objects came them. At that time, sir, human beings could not speak. We had no gift of language at that time. And people had, however, great mental power. A man would go into the bush and using the power of his mind, actually call out an animal which he wanted to hunt and kill for his children. And the animal would appear and kneel down before the man, and the man would kill the animal and take it home. But when the Chitawuli arrived in Africa, they told our people that they were gods and that they were going to give us human beings great gifts on one condition. We had to worship them and accept them as our creators. Some told our people that they were our elder brothers and that this earth had produced them generations ago. And they said they had come back to the green womb of their mother and that they were going to make us into gods. What they did, they created a very strange pair of caves in the land. They dug two caves. In one cave was a green light in another cave was a red light. And they drove human beings into these caves. And each human being had to choose which cave the human being wanted to go into. And those who went into the green cave came out as winners. And those who went into the red cave came out as men. And then the talkers, the Chitauri, told our people that now they were perfect. But the moment the first men saw the first women, a terrible row erupted. The women hated the men because they looked between their legs and they saw what they thought were snakes dangling between the legs of the men. And the men hated the women because they looked on their chest and they saw these big things. What they were, they did not know. And then the Chitauri laughed. It was to them a very, very big joke. And then the Chitauri said, If you serve us, you wretched little human beings, we are going to make you into gods. And the human beings agreed to serve the Chitauri. And the Chitauri gave human beings a second gift, the gift of language. People started talking with their tongues where they had talked with their minds before. And there was a big rubbish starting again. Because this man did not know the language of that man. And when this man greeted that man, this man thought that he was being insulted. And so a lot of murder and culpable homicide started taking place all over the world. When our people were given language, they found to their horror that they had lost much of their mental powers. They had paid a terrible price. But the Chitauri were now the masters of human beings. 
they made them the, the human beings to go into holes in the ground and to mine metal, gold, copper, tin, all kinds of metal the Chitauri forced our people to mine. And the people were very unhappy because they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, 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 they couldn't cope with the new sexual differences which were there now between men and women. And then, from amongst the, 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 the Chitauri came a very good Phoenix Chitauri. Her name was Mai Varantwari Samahong. Mai Varantwari Samahong was the senior wife of the terrible chief of the Chitauri, Umbaba Orontwari Samahong. She was sorry for human beings, this great reptile lady. She said to the poor people, Ow, you are unhappy. And the people said, Yes, great one. We go into the holes every day, we dig the stones and we bring it to the gods. But we are not happy. And my Zarantwari scratched her scaly chin and began to think and to think she was terribly ugly. Her eyes were awful, like lights in the darkness. But she had mercy in her heart. And she taught the men and the women how to make love. And she said, look, we, we divided you into males and females. Now this action is going to bring you together. Ah, but it did not. Because anyone who receives the gift from the Ntwari, the children of the python, is always in trouble. What happened was that when one guy slept with his wife, he didn't find her much. So he went to steal another guy's wife, and there was a brick, a big remorse, as we say in African, starting. So men started stealing each other's wives, and each other's girlfriends and women started stealing each other's husbands and there was a big nonsense in the land. And King Umbaba, the terrible uh, lord of the Ntwari, the, the reptile people said, look what you've done, you stupid old woman. Now these people, they are, they are making such a noise. Listen to all that screaming in the bush. They are busy making love there and our gold is not being dug and you are responsible for this. Zavantwari thought and thought and thought and thought and then she got a plan and she said, I will make them stop. When they make love to each other, the female is going to get pregnant. And when she is pregnant, the male is going to leave her alone and that noise in the bush will not be so disturbing to you, my lord. And Umbaba said, you had better. There is no production yet. And so all the women in the world was pregnant, and Umbaba was furious with his wife. And so it went on and on, until one day, Zavantwari activated a black hero called Mueru. And Mueru challenged the great chief of the serpent people to a fight. And he cut off the royal pennies of the king of the snake people. And that caused a big war. Mueru ran away. But Umbaba, the terrible chief of the people, caught him and arrested him and brought him to his village. And there, the great chief Korontwari Umbaba said, Look, you cut off my thing, and I have replaced it with one made of gold, and I can't make love to my wife anymore. You think too much, you wretched little human being. Now, Umbaba had a terrible name. 
in one of his hands. A claw. And with this claw, he drove the claw into Tuamweru's nostril, making a terrible hole into his brain. And he started drinking Mweru's brain. And then he threw away the corpse. To this day, we believe that the people, the Chitauri people, they eat human brains. And strangely enough, scientists have found skulls where the human brain has been removed and eaten by someone or something. 